You pray with me, please. Gracious God, I thank you for this day, for the opportunity to be gathered in this place around this word. And as we come before you, God, we do pray that you would receive our desire to serve you as we say, here I am, that that would count with you as an opportunity and occasion to work with us so that we might, through this word and this time together, be more faithful servants when we leave this place. In your name we pray. Amen. I'm going to begin by having, asking you to do an, a very brief exercise with me and apologize. I can't look two places at the same time, so I'm going to look here for just a minute, but you come along with us, okay? I'm going to ask everybody to, to, to pay attention to me and follow my directions. Raise your right hand. Very good. So far, so good. Raise your right hand. And now with that right hand, make uh, the A-OK sign, right? So make that circle with your thumb and your uh, first finger, right? Okay. Now I want you to take the circle and place it right here on your chin, Love it. Love it. Thank you so much for playing. What did I say? I said, put it on my chin. Didn't I? I, I think it was Brian Maple back there. Did I catch that, Brian? Brian went like this. <laughs> I had, there was someone at first service that kind of went halfway, like right between. It's a great illustration, though, isn't it? Sue Ann, Sue Ann uh, mentioned here in her prayer, at, or in her offering invitation, actions speak louder than words. And I love that illustration. Someone shared that with me years ago, and it, it really never ceases to work. And it's such a reminder that we are more persuaded by actions than by words. And let me share this. I think this is really interesting. How many of you know Jim and Debbie Hofert? Jim and Debbie Hofert. Jim Hofert is blind, and he was at our 8 o'clock service today. Guess who got it right? Isn't that interesting? So it's really compelling, too, that, you know, that when we're so persuaded by the things that we see, actions speak louder than words. I did a funeral this week right here in the sanctuary for Bill Rule. Bill was a longtime member of Central Christian, 97 years old, 97, married 75 and a half years, four children, 13 grandchildren, 18 great grandchildren, two great great grandchildren. 31 of those descendants were of age, meaning they were 20 in their 20s and above. And I say that only because at the funeral and the day before, every one of those descendants uh, could recite this mantra that Bill was said to have lived his life by, and that was this. If, if you are a good Christian, you shouldn't have to tell anyone. Right? In other words, people should see it in the example you're setting. Actions speak louder than words. And of course, when we hear Bill Rule's mantra our minds probably go back to the great St. Francis of Assisi who far more famously said, preach the gospel at all times and only use words if absolutely necessary. Actions speak louder than words. And that comes to us also in the letter of James at the end of the New Testament. James chapter 2 verse 18 says, I by my works will show you my faith. I by my actions will show you my faith. How will we know what a person believes and stands for? It will be shown in their actions. Actions louder than words. I experienced that in a, in, a, in, a, in a different kind of way. At the beginning of my ministry, I was invited to attend a money management workshop. It was really stewardship, stewardship for the church, but also personal stewardship. 
And the seminar leader had all of us attendees there around these round tables in a conference-type room. And, and they asked us to in, imagine that we were looking at our credit card statements. Now it would be PayPal account or, or whatever, your last purchases on your gotobanking.com. But we asked us to imagine our, that we were looking at our credit card statements, and after we had done that, they said, that's what you really believe in. <laughs> That's what you really value. doesn't matter what you say you stand for, where you put your investment, your real physical financial investment, that's what you really believe in. Actions speak louder than words. I think about athletes today and celebrities. Primarily, I'm thinking in, in, in this example of athletes who are public figures. They're celebrities celebrity athletes, and every once in a while, there's one that will say something like this, I don't want to be a role model. I just want to live my life. I don't want to be a role model. Don't ask me to be something that I don't want to be. Have you heard athletes say that or in some form or fashion? Well, the cynic in me wants to say, well, you pretty much got the job when you endorsed that million-dollar check. But there's truth to that whether there's lots of money involved or not. You see, the moment we bring a child into the world, we are that child's public figure. The moment an elder gets up and prays at the communion table, he or she is the church's public figure. The moment the teacher gets up in front of the classroom and speaks, he or she is that class's public figure. We are always in the public, whether we're a celebrity or not. The eyes of some aspect of the public is on us all the time. And they will be watching what kind of example we set. And they will likely be far more influenced by our actions than by our words. And that's the theme of our message today from 1 Corinthians Hannah's going to read that for us in a moment. But we're, we've been spending some time in 1 Corinthians. We have this new church in Corinth at the very beginnings of Christianity. It's this little fledgling group in, the, in a big, big world. It's trying to make its way. It's struggling. The struggle that they're having today revolves around food. Revolves around food. This is found on page 171 in the New Testament of your Pew Bible, if you'd like to follow along. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 8, 1 through 10. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists, and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom we are all things, and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge, since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you who possess knowledge eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So this, the issue here is in this city in Corinth in Greece, the vast majority of the people were pagans, meaning that they worshiped many gods. 
In fact, and we looked at this in our Bible study this past Thursday, you can, there's an archaeologist have, have reconstructed the city of Corinth around this time, and there were between 12 and 15 altars, meaning at least 12 to 15 different pagan gods were worshipped in this little tiny city, relatively speaking. And part of that worship of those pagan gods involved animal sacrifice. And this is how it worked. If you worship the God at this temple, the priest or the priestess there might say, okay, to win favor from this God, you need to bring this animal and, and sacrifice it. So you would bring the animal and sacrifice it and, uh, uh, or, or pay for an animal to be sacrificed, and the animal would be ceremoniously killed. And then during part of the ritual involved the priest or the priestess eating a little bit of the meat. So it's cooked, and then uh, a part of it was eaten ceremoniously, but just a little part. And they would do that over and over again for all the people that wanted to win favor from this God. So that meant that they had lots of leftover meat. <laughs> and what do you do with that meat? Well, the temple the, for that, that God would turn around and sell it back to the public. So it just... Like you go to the market, there's free-range this, and there's organic this, and there's corn-fed this, and then there's, you know, pagan meat this. It's just one of the different choices. But people would then buy it at the market and take it home and prepare it and eat it. And so the Christians were saying, we know that there's, we don't worship idols, but what about this meat? It I don't, tastes good, or it's cheap, or it's handy. Uh, we live right next to the, the, the place where it's sold. They write to Paul, is it okay if we eat this meat sacrificed to idols? That's the problem. And Paul writes back and says, well, technically, technically it's okay because eating food is not going to get you closer to God or refraining from eating is not going to put you further away from God. But he says the real issue is the example you're setting. So he's always wanting to dig deeper with us when he writes his letters. And he says the real issue is the example. And just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should do something. Very practical wisdom. And then so the people got in there right back and they said, okay, we got that. We, just because we can doesn't mean we should. But the next question is how do we know if we should? How do we know if we should or should not do something? And Paul's answer is this. It's very, it's very beautiful, really. He wants them to know that the eyes of the public are on them. Somebody's watching you all the time. Somebody's watching you. And if what you're doing is confusing them about God or worse, leading them away from God, then just because you can do it doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. In this particular case, if, they, if, if, if you're eating of this food, which is okay for you, if that leads people to think that worshiping idols is okay, then just because you can do it doesn't mean that you should. So the test for Paul, the test for Paul is the impact of our actions on others. Good for us to think about. What kind of impact are our actions having? Are, they, are we undertaking the kind of actions that build people up, encourage people, strengthen people, lead people in the right direction? Or are the actions that we are undertaking actually keeping people from growing? The measuring stick for Paul is always other-centered. It's always other-centered. It's for Paul, it's not enough that it's not an issue of, of me doing whatever I'm free to do that may bring me great enjoyments, but really the first question is, what's the impact on others? And am I helping to meet the needs of others with the actions that I'm undertaking? And that really, meeting the actions of others, meeting the needs of others and the actions I'm undertaking, that's really what love is. It's love. And sooner or later, whether it's Paul or Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, we're going to come around to love because love is the essential quality of the ideal community. Love. Love. One of my favorite ways of thinking about that comes from, not from the religious world, but from the sports world. You remember John Wooden? Raise your hand if you remember or know the name John Wooden. John Wooden from Martinsville, Indiana but is most well known for his 
coaching of UCLA basketball in the 1960s, 1970s, arguably the most successful coach in American sports history. Well, toward the end of his life, he lived into his 90s, died several years ago now, but he was asked about what the secret to success was. What's the secret to a successful team, a team that wins championships? And what I love about his answer is that it had nothing to do with basketball. I mean, here's a person at the pinnacle of their profession that could have said, well, it's about strategy or it's about hard work. It's about the 10,000 quality hours that we put into our craft as technicians. He could have said all of that, but he said this. He said it's very simple. If the players on the team love each other, and really care about each other as human beings, then you have a chance to be champions. He said, if, you're, if the players on the team do not really love and care about each other, then you may win a lot of games, but you'll never be champions. And I thought, how beautiful to put in perspective what life is like in community. It's, it's, at some level, it's other-centered. Am I, are the actions that I'm undertaking meeting the needs of someone else? And is that done in genuine sincerity and care? And you see, for Paul, love then is not an emotion. It's not a feeling. Love is active. It's doing things. And it's not just doing things. It's setting a good example because it's always setting a good example because it considers the best good for those around it. That's what love is. And so that's why Paul wants us to think as we undertake any action, what is the impact? And if I'm not having, if my action is not having as growth fulfilling an impact on others as it could be, even though I'm able to do it, I might not need to do it. God may be asking me not to do it. And so in that sense, love is sometimes about restraints. Love is about restraint. It's not doing things that we're able to do because doing so would not benefit those around us. It's refraining to do from doing what we could do so that others may be benefited in the process. And there's some great examples from Scripture. In fact, everywhere we look, we see this kind of love being embodied. We've talked about Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus before. Joseph was justified in leaving Mary. He was justified. The law allowed it. It was lawful and acceptable for him to do so. And yet, he chose not to do what he could do, and we benefited in the process. Jesus grew, and we grew with him. And that same Jesus at the end of his life, he hung on the cross, not deserving this end that he received. He could have come down from the cross. Nobody would have complained about that, his choice. In fact, everybody around him was saying, come down from the cross. And yet he knew that if he did what he could do, the gates of salvation would be closed to us. So he refrained from doing what he was able to do, and we benefited in the process. And then after he rose from the grave, Mary Magdalene, she met him in the garden, you remember that? And when she recognized him, first she thought he was the gardener, then when she recognized him as the risen Lord, she grabbed hold of him. And we can't blame her for that. She was justified in holding on to him. She thought that he died, that she lost him forever. Now he's back again. Who among us wouldn't want to do the same thing? I thought I lost you once. I don't want to lose you again. But Jesus said, if you don't refrain from doing what you could do, I can't fulfill my mission for the world. So Mary Magdalene chose not to do what she was able to do could do, was free to do, and we benefited in the process. So as we go forth and we think about living differently for Christ, it's one thing to say, here I am, Lord. It's another thing to go and do what God wants us to do. And as we consider doing that, let us remember that sometimes the best examples that we set are choosing not to do what we could do so that the needs of others might be met in the process. Let us pray. 
Gracious God, we thank you for loving us, for setting a good example for us, and help us in response and in return to model that in our own actions and in our own lives. Amen.